Kelly, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, gives the commencement address at the U.S. Naval Academy. Now, a hearing on technology and the legislative process. California Congressman David Dreyer's subcommittee assesses the impact of technological changes in Congress. These include video conferencing of witnesses' testimony at hearings and the use of the Internet. We'll hear testimony from Michigan Congressman Vern Ellers, Progress and Freedom Foundation President Jeffrey Eisenach, among others. This hearing runs an hour and 50 minutes. The uh, subcommittee will come to order. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome all of you to the 21st century and to convene this uh, historic hearing. Uh, it is, as you can see by the surroundings, uh, a wired interactive hearing that will begin to examine the issue of how information technology will transform the United States Congress. At the same time, I thought it relevant to the hearing that we should experience and showcase some of these technologies that we hope can make committee hearings more effective. A member of the subcommittee, Mr. McGinnis, who I see over there, Scott, is participating via video conference from Pueblo, Colorado. Also joining us uh, from cyberspace is one of our hearing witnesses, Mr. Patrick uh, Flavin from the state capital of St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, he is the Secretary of State of the, uh, well, I'll go through an introduction of him uh, when we get into this. He's uh, Secretary of State for the Minnesota State Senate. Um, let me say that uh, we're also privileged to have my uh, colleague Vern Ehlers here. Uh, all of the technologies that we are utilizing this morning, uh, video conferencing, television coverage, and internet use are in use in some form or another by a number of state legislatures around the country. I'm very pleased to welcome the ranking minority member, Mr. Bielenson, uh, who has arrived. We wanted to start the 21st century punctually, uh, Tony, and we've got a place for you uh, right over here. Uh, I, I was mentioning the, uh, the role that state legislatures have played. In California, for example, people can watch the assembly hearings on cable television and can call in and participate in the hearing. We don't have that capable uh, that capability to do uh, here today, but we do have a website which I actually mentioned on C-SPAN a few minutes ago, and I used the uh, incorrect uh, uh, code to uh, get in on that, and I'm going to correct that now. It is www.house.gov slash rules underline org slash 21 home.html. I've almost gotten that committed to memory. Uh, it explains uh, what this hearing is about and allows us to receive public feedback as we examine this issue over the next several months. We also have an email address so that people watching the hearing on C-SPAN can contact us directly with comments and questions, and that address is cyberrep, C-Y-B-E-R-R-E-P, at AOL.com. Anybody who has spent a great deal of time in Congress or studying the Congress has developed an appreciation and an understanding for the language uh, of the Hill, terms such as previous question, cloture, germaneness, motion to recommit, budget authority, five-minute rule, and so on, are certainly familiar to those of us who are members of the Rules Committee and those who follow the proceedings here. But as we approach this new millennium, a new language of the Hill is taking hold. It includes such terms as internet, networks, open systems, client server systems, and graphical user interfaces, to name just a few. If the experience of other organizations holds true, these new terms and the technologies they describe will fundamentally alter the customs, operations, and responsibilities of the United States Congress. There are a number of factors driving Congress's investment in new information technologies. Our newer colleagues are demanding the efficiencies and flexibility that come from cost-reducing and time-saving technologies that most organizations across the country benefit from. 
At the same time, the American people are demanding real-time access to information so that they can play a more meaningful role in making government work better. Technology can help us bridge the gap of time and distance to bring representative government closer to the people. It can help us to create a more orderly process and to reduce costs and bureaucracy. But at the same time, misapplied technology can exacerbate inequities in our political system, maintain those aspects of the status quo that require change, and undermine the nature of representative government that has served our country so well over the past two centuries. This is the beginning of a long-term effort to determine how we can ensure that technology is used effectively and responsibly. The goal is to determine how we can meet the internal demand for more flexibility and efficiency and the external public demand for increased access to Congress and its information while maintaining the Jeffersonian tradition of representative democracy and the decorum and deliberative nature of the House. We have with us uh, a number of uh, witnesses, as I've said uh, at the outset, uh, who have a great deal of experience on the issue of technology and the impact of those on legislative institutions. Uh, before uh, recognizing the ranking minority member, Mr. Bielenson, let me describe how I hope we'll be able to proceed with the hearing. Unless there is an objection, uh, I'd like to recognize the witnesses as one panel, and each witness has been asked to summarize their statements in uh, five minutes after which we would proceed somewhat informally with a discussion unencumbered by the five-minute rule. Uh, in other words, if you have something to say, we're going to ask those uh, who are out there in cyberspace to just speak up. This is a voice-activated uh, system. It's an alternative uh, hearing format that uh, I think will provide the opportunity for a better free-flow uh, discussion. And I know it is somewhat awkward with all this equipment around, and we're with the traditional uh, committee structure that we had uh, uh, hoped that we would not have. We were actually hoping to be sitting at the lower level there. And I should say uh, also that uh, I, I'm uh, sorry that my uh, colleague, the uh, chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Bill Thomas, uh, could not be here, who has spent a great deal of time working on this. And uh, he uh, and Mr. Ehlers worked closely uh, on these issues. And also, I'm very sorry that uh, the Speaker of the House, who had hoped to be here uh, coming uh, by video conference from Florida, is unable because of technical problems that we've had uh, to be here. He very much wanted to participate and uh, as recently as yesterday uh, told me that he hoped to be able to uh, to be following the uh, Congress's move towards the third wave information-based society, something in which he has a, a little interest. And uh, so he's uh, sorry that he can't be here. Uh, my colleague from California, Tony Bielenson, has chosen to uh, retire from the Congress before the millennium. And uh, this may have uh, something to do with it. We uh, am very, uh, we're very pleased that uh, he has brought his uh, decades of expertise uh, to this hearing, and we look forward to uh, his input. And I'm happy to call on my dear friend from California. Thank you, Chairman. This is all. You have to hit the switch, Tony. That's something that's new for the 21st century. This, this is a little daunting, Mr. Chairman. This is not the reason I'm leaving, but, but if I had known about this, I perhaps would have would have left a little earlier. Uh, I, commend our, I commend our Chairman, Mr. Dreyer, for, for holding this hearing on the use of advanced technology in Congress, a, a new topic for the Rules Committee, I believe. And I join with him in welcoming our distinguished uh, witnesses who so graciously agreed to be here with us this morning. We look forward to learning more about the communications technologies that currently exist, as well as those that are anticipated in the not too distant future. Some of these devices appear to offer excellent prospects for helping us run our offices more efficiently and effectively and for improving operations here in the Congress generally. At the same time, the rapid advances in the kinds of technology that are now or will soon be available to Congress pose tremendous new challenges and questions for us. We need to be sure that we have the best possible process for determining which types of equipment are best suited for our legislative offices, are the most cost effective and are least likely to be qu become quickly outmoded. We need to be wary of the excitement generated by some of the new technologies and not let that entice us to invest huge amounts of taxpayers' money on equipment we don't really need, or worse, on equipment that is actually detrimental to our work. The danger with some of these new technologies is, is that they could increase pressures to make changes in the legislative process that we may well come uh, to regret. It's easy to imagine, for example, that if a secure, if a secure system for remote voting is within reach te technologically, 
our leaders will face enormous demands from members to be permitted to vote from their districts, something that would change the very nature of Congress uh, very much, I believe, for the worse. Or if it's technically possible to participate in two meetings at uh, once, one in person, the other by checking in periodically by video, there'll be two obvious, two obvious pitfalls. One is that the member would be trying to concentrate on two different subjects, giving neither one the full attention it needs. The other is that we'll be facing increasing demands to be several places at one time, so to speak, making our often frantic lives even more so. Thus installing video conferencing equipment in the Capitol complex in a well-meaning attempt to make it possible for members to participate in more meetings could in fact encourage behavior that is damaging to the deliberative process. And finally, I, I personally worry about losing the essence of communication and the real understanding that results from that through the increased use of, of advanced technologies. We have one witness who will be testifying today from Minnesota, which is great in some ways. We'll get the benefit of his expertise without incurring the cost of a flight to Washington, but I imagine it will be harder to engage in the give and take of questioning with him than it will be, than it will be with the witnesses who are here with us in person. And I imagine it will be more difficult for our colleague and friend, Mr. McInnes, to be fully engaged in the hearing if he's participating by video than if he were here in person. If holding hearings by video conference becomes a common practice, my sense is that the lack of face-to-face -face and personal contact is likely to make hearings even less substantive and less deliberative than many, unfortunately, already are. I do hope that through the course of this hearing, our witnesses will give us their best advice on how we can help ensure that these technologies operate for the benefit rather than to the detriment of the men and women who serve in Congress, of the legislative process, and most importantly, of course, uh, for, of the people that we're elected to represent. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bielenson. And uh, I have to uh, say that I'm very pleased to have the chairman of the Legislative Budget and Budget Process Subcommittee, who has uh, taken the time uh, from his schedule to join us. And uh, I'd like to call on Mr. Goss. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I do that, we're dealing with all the technology. The little hissing that we hear apparently is coming from our friend, uh, the microphone of our friend, Mr. Flavin, in Minnesota. And uh, let me say to you, Mr. Secretary, if you could hit the mute button on the microphone there, I'm told that it will not create the, uh, the noise that we're getting here in the committee room. Apparently, they've been trying to call you, so they've relied on me to communicate with you. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds great now. Now. I th thought it did. Uh, Lap, how are we doing? Okay. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's with some sense of wonderment that I'm here and watching all of this work. I would want to create you for your initiative and creativity on this. I think every member of Congress is probably suffering from uh, information overload. And uh, any ways that we can deal with that uh, more effectively uh, are going to be very important, especially since technology is going to bring more information to us how we screen and handle that and how we use technology to help us rather than to work against us is going to be very important. And I'll come back to that point in just a second. I, uh, I listened very closely to what my colleague and good friend from California said. And I share a little bit of a concern that uh, we become too robotic uh, in our life, uh, not just here, but in, as uh, more and more technology comes across our life. And those of us who are a little older have to cope with it and learn new skills uh, every day. But I, I firmly believe that Congress is never going to be put on autopilot. That's just not going to happen. Maybe some people think it's a good idea. I don't. Uh, I think this is a deliberative body. It is very much the people's house. The interest and awareness that technology offers for people will help us overcome apathy in our country. And we all decry the small amount of voter turnout that happens quite often in our national elections. So maybe, in fact, uh, we can steer this all in a way that we can create more interest and more participation at the ballot box. And that, of course, is healthy for democracy. In terms of education, we all agree that it's important that people know what is going on on the Hill and in Washington. That's a critical factor. Uh, we all want an informed uh, and well-educated electorate. They, we want them to know what they're casting their ballots about when they go and not just be subject to the two-minute soundbite or the 30-second soundbite or the even worse, the the talking heads and the anchors of the broadcast networks who are guiding and molding opinions uh, and people leave it at that when there's always so much more behind the news. And I guess the final area is the, the area that really attracted my interest today uh, was this question 
of uh, secrecy and accountability. I think that technology offers a great opportunity for offense, but clearly we have got to have some defense in it, too. And I am reminded of this because we had a very uh, interesting and controversial vote yesterday in the House, and I got a lot of unprintable, untraceable uh, input. Uh, and so I am very interested on, on how we use this technology so that there will always be accountability uh, to those people who are sending messages as well. And of course, uh, I serve on the Intelligence Committee. I am very concerned in terms of our national security about protecting whatever technology we have to make sure that it is used properly and not abused. Having said all that, I am delighted that there is such a stellar array of witnesses coming before us, as well as such a stellar array of members of Congress participating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you are certainly among them, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, let us uh, now charge ahead with uh, my very good friend, Vern Ehlers, who is President of the House Republican Sophomore Class and Chairman of the House Oversight uh, Committee's Information Systems Working Group. And uh, what I saw, he describes himself as a, a Trekkie or some, I don't know exactly what the term that you use, Vern, is, but we know that you're an expert on all this stuff that's around us, and so uh, we're very privileged to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the phrase was techie, not trekkie. <laughs> well, yeah. I come from California, you my, know, and uh, my ears look too normal for, uh, to be a trekkie. Right. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I do congratulate you on setting up this, uh, what is in a sense an experiment in precisely the topic we're discussing today. I will try to uh, summarize my comments in five minutes, since I did not have time to prepare written testimony. And I we're, we're moving here. Vince just told me that I failed to recognize my colleague, Scott McGinnis, who is in Pueblo, Colorado. And there's, there you go, Tony, the fact that he's not sitting right here, and I'm looking at Minnesota, Minnesota yeah. Tony just said, out of sight, out of mind. Well, we, we uh, need another screen. W would you mind if, before you went into your five minutes, I recognized uh, Scott McGinnis? Uh, can we uh, see <laughs> Pueblo, Colorado pop up there? All we're looking at is Minnesota now. Oh, uh, Scott, if you can hear me, you've got to turn your mic on, and that, that's the way you'll pop up here. So I'm OK. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Uh, speak up, Scott, and uh, keep talking, and you should pop onto the screen here. We're trying to prove Tony right. Bielenson well, wrong. First of all, Mr. Chairman. Sounds like Scott. Uh, don't be yeah. concerned, Mr. Chairman, that because I'm out of your sight, I'm going to be out of your mind. I'm here. <laughs> and uh, looking forward. There, there you are. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> we see you now, Scott. Right. <laughs> uh, here in Colorado, sitting to my... Sitting to my left is Dr. Joe May, who is the president of Pueblo Community College. This is a very exciting event for us today in Colorado. As many of my colleagues know, and I send my greetings to Mr. Bielenson, of course, Mr. Goss, Mr. Chairman, yourself, Mr. Ellers, and other members. As you know, we were all together about 10 hours ago. I have now since come out to Colorado. We in this community are excited because it allows us to participate. Now, we are in a remote section. Uh, out in rural America. My district is one of the largest districts in the country. In fact, we have probably 56 mountains over 14,000 feet, and my district alone, just my district, is larger than the state of Florida. So communication and the advanced technology, Mr. Chairman, that we're about to discuss today, I think holds a very, very exciting future because we're going to be able to take a lot of what we do in Washington and place it in the small communities, the communities of Grand Junction or clear up in Meeker, Colorado or southwestern Colorado, down in the mountains of New Mexico, over in Summit County or here as we're doing in Pueblo, Colorado. So we look forward to that. Again, this communication, Mr. Chairman, I think is going to be key. Mr. Goss's points and Mr. Bielenson's points are well taken. We are at the very beginning stages of this type of communication. So there are a lot of things that we're going to have to work out. There are a lot of bugs that we're going to have to go in and sort out. But it's a thrill to be out here in Colorado. And as a result of our communication today, I'm able to participate in this community meeting and yet be able to travel in my district. Mind you, to get across my district will take several hours of flying. Today, I will be able to participate in four or five local community events here in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm able to go on to another community called Canyon City and then fly over halfway across the state to Grand Junction to participate in an event there tonight and yet participate in the community meeting there with you in Washington, D.C. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the meeting. I want to thank uh, 
Dr. May and Pueblo Community College, a great institution out here in Colorado, for allowing us to use these facilities. And I'm surrounded, it may not be on camera, but I'm surrounded by several members of the community who are, wanted to come down and see this. This is exciting news for us in Colorado. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing us to participate. Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, and uh, thank you, Dr. May, for hosting us in, uh, at Pueblo Community College. Now let's charge ahead uh, with our colleague, uh, Mr. Ehlers. Sorry for that, Vern, but... Absolutely no problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, uh, first of all, a very brief history of my involvement in this. You know, when I came to the Congress in 1994, within a week after I was here, uh, Mr. Gingrich asked me to try to help bring the Republican Conference up to speed in computer matters. He was, became aware of my history of computerizing the Michigan Senate and asked me to repeat that experience here. In 1995, uh, he, uh, we managed to uh, fulfill his pledge to the American public of putting documents on the internet while he was giving his inaugural speech after being sworn in as a new speaker. We flipped the switch and the house documents that were ready on the computer were made available over the internet. In addition, he asked me to uh, develop a plan to computerize the house, which has resulted in the Cyber Congress plan, which we are now in the process of implementing. And by the end of this year, we hope to have in place a good hardware and software infrastructure which can serve as a basis for growth in the future. The objectives of what we are trying to do, first of all, is to have all materials, documents, etc., available to both the members and the public as soon as possible after they are prepared. We are hoping to develop a common messaging system and directory for the House of Representatives and eventually for the entire Hill including the Senate and the ancillary organizations, such as GPO, Library of Congress, and so forth. We are trying to develop a common document format and language, developing it in the SGML language, which will have some real implications I'll mention in a moment if I have time. We are trying to have complete connectivity on the Hill between every computer and every other computer, and also complete connectivity to the Internet. Our goal is to have all members sign on to the Internet and be able to receive email and have a home page that the public can view. We are also hope that we can have all members and staff become not just computer literate, but computer knowledgeable. We hope to improve staff and member efficiency through our, the system we're developing. We also hope to reduce the use of paper, probably one of the most important and perhaps the most uh, unachievable objective that we have. We uh, hope to have video conferencing readily available and we hope we are well along the way to developing an intranet for use on the Hill. In terms of the future and what we're working towards there, uh, these are not well-defined objectives, not established by the committee or anything, but things I have in mind. Video conferencing at every desk, which is readily achievable so that uh, if you want to talk to a colleague or two or three colleagues uh, before a committee meeting about a topic, you simply dial them up and use your computer to communicate with them. Uh, we pl expect to have many more remote committee meetings such as this one. By remote committee meeting, I mean all types of variations. It could be a hearing here with witnesses in remote location. For example, when we were considering the uh, National Park Bill for the California Desert it would have been very helpful to allow the citizens there to testify before the committee here without having them travel here or us travel there. Or we could just have an occasional remote witness or involve a remote committee member as we are doing with Mr. McGinnis right now. Uh, I expect we will have more remote speeches to constituents where we communicate with our constituents through video conferencing. I uh, expect fairly shortly we'll be able to get into a large number of paperless administrative transactions on the Hill. The, the vouchers, the payroll, the standard documents that flow hither, thither, and yon. And we expect to have those all on computer, paperless, with electronic signature. And that may require some rule changes on your part to validate those electronic signatures. I expect to uh, see considerable development in groupware and groupware and daily use on the intranet that I mentioned we are hoping to develop. And I uh, hope that we will see common use of personal digital assistance. You see a few members carrying these around now. They're still a bit cumbersome, 
and not uh, as useful as they should be, but I expect within five years or so, uh, instead of carrying the schedule card that we all carry, we would have our little personal digital assistant each morning. Our staff would simply plug that into their computer. Your schedule for the day, for the month, and for the next year would be on there, and it would be uploaded daily so that you would have all the information you need for that day. Also, notes on committee meetings, et cetera, could all be there. You could review these instantaneously just by pulling it out of your pocket. A few things that I think we should not expect, and I have some strong feelings on some of these. I would not expect that we, we will have remote voting on the floor or in committee. I have a personal bias against that, and that's where I am with Mr. Bielenson. I think that personal contact, the involvement in discussion, both at the committee level and on the floor, is necessary for intelligent voting. And I would be opposed to any remote voting, although it's technically feasible. I, I, we could install that and have it operational within a week or two if we wanted it. I think it's, uh, it's something we should not have. I think we should not expect less per personal interaction between members. I think the personal action, interaction is what makes the, the work flow around the Congress, and we should continue that. Also, do not expect a reduction in staff as a result of computerization. So many people put in computers in the expectation they're going to pay for themselves through reduction in staff. It doesn't work that way. You can do uh, much more, but don't expect that you'll be doing it with less staff. A good example, before I went to the Michigan legislature, I used to be frustrated. I would write letters, never got responses. When I got there, I found out why. Uh, they had one secretary for three members using a typewriter. Most letters just were read and pitched into the wastebasket. Uh, by the time I left, all the ma constituent mail was answered, both the House and the Senate. It's the same staff level, but much more work being done. What will the impact on Congress be of these changes? First of all, there will be, I think, considerably chained role for the Clerk of the House and the Secretary of the Senate, and also for the Government Printing Office and the Library of Congress in terms of how information is handled. Uh, just as an example, I expect that we, we will have print on demand. And rather than having GPO print 5,000 copies of a report uh, so they have enough on hand to supply an anticipated need, they would produce the bare minimum necessary. Anyone else requesting a copy would have one printed on demand, or you could print it in your own office, if you wish, using the Internet. I expect rules changes are going to be required. We are going to have to standardize certain procedures, practices, documents, etc. This is particularly true of committee documents. And uh, this is going to require rule changes, perhaps even some statutory changes to ensure uniformity from one committee to another, both in terms of availability and practices. We have to formalize our, formalize our document initiation, maintenance, purging, and availability practices. And I have compiled, which I will be working through the process in uh, House Oversight Committee and other committees, this is nine pages, fairly small type, as you can see. All the documents that I could discover are being produced with some regularity in the Hill. And if we want to make those available to the public, we have to have a mechanism for deciding who initiates them, who maintains them, who purges them, gets them out of the system, and uh, on what schedule. I believe we have to make these available to the public as soon as possible. Right now, oftentimes these are delayed three or four weeks because the committee chairman has not yet approved the document. We have to uh, look at the financial aspects. Which costs of the new system are allocated to individual members? Which costs to committees? Which to the general agencies such as House Information Researches, Resources, the clerk, or to other accounts? And we have to establish some rules about how to handle remote hearings, remote witnesses, uh, swearing-in process, things of this sort. Uh, there's, there's much ground to be touched here uh, that is within your bailiwick. <laughs> Legislative changes are also going to be required. Currently, CRS documents, by law, are the property of the Congress and the congressman in particular who requested a specific report. They are not on the Internet now and cannot be made on the, available on the Internet without changing the law. And that's uh, an issue of some importance that we have to discuss. We may also need legislative changes uh, so that we can do our job better and ensure that we have access to certain executive branch documents. Now, that is going to be a very touchy uh, balance of powers issue, separation of powers issue. But I think we could, our appropriation committee could function much more effectively if they had online access to the Department of Treasury computers and could follow the trends 
as quickly as Treasury employees do. They could determine account balances, see where the money is flowing. Uh, we would just have a much more knowledgeable Congress, and we could make much more intelligent decisions. But again, those would require legislative changes. Uh, perhaps even constitutional issues would be raised there. Just in closing, a few dangers. The danger is, as Mr. Billens had said earlier, less personal interaction. I said I do not expect less personal interaction. By our very nature, we tend to be gregarious or we tend not to get elected. So we are still going to require and expect personal interaction. But there is that danger that we can become more remote ourselves, and I, I think we should fight that. Another danger is un the undue influence that technology-savvy individuals or groups might have, and that's readily possible now. With, uh, if someone currently can watch C-SPAN, get on the Internet, get a copy of the bill off the net, get a copy of the amendment that's being debated on the floor, and fire off an email message to their, their congressperson, which is fully possible now for those members on the net. Those individuals who are, have that equipment and that ability could have an undue influence on legislation. Uh, you also have to w watch out. Uh, there is a class distinction at the moment because those individuals tend to have more money to be able to afford this. I think that distinction will disappear in a few years as computers' uh, attachment to the Internet becomes very uh, inexpensive. But then you still have to worry about the class distinction of the working versus the non-working the retirees or the unemployed who have the time to sit and watch C-SPAN and dial in and get the information and let us know what they think uh, would have much more impact on the process than those who are working and don't have the time to do this. And so you, we have to be very careful about uh, that particular danger. And one last danger I wanted to mention, and that is the possible public revulsion at their ability to watch this process more closely. <laughs> And I mean that in all seriousness, because if your experience is like mine, when, when you try to explain to the public what has happened in a particular case, yesterday the minimum wage is a classic example. Did I vote for or did I vote against the minimum wage? I voted against the amendment to add it to the bill, but I voted for the bill. Uh, trying to explain that to the public is difficult. And the public is watching the complexities of our internal process here we have to be concerned about them not fully understanding it and developing a certain revulsion at the process and just saying, oh, those guys don't know what they're doing or why don't they make it more simple, et cetera. Uh, that's uh, a quick summary of some thoughts on this issue, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry uh, I don't have time to go into more detail on those, but that may emerge in the discussion. Thank you very much. Able to. Thank you very much, and we appreciate having your expertise here. Let's uh, beam out to uh, Minnesota to the Secretary of the Senate, uh, Mr. Patrick Flavin, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Senate under the jurisdiction of the Committee on Rules and Administration. His main functions are to act as parliamentarian and as administrator of the internal operations of the Senate. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I've been asked to uh, urge you to speak very closely, and you too, Scott, when the time comes, to the microphone, and that'll help us, uh, I'm told, uh, hear better here in the, in the hearing room. So if I could now uh, call on uh, Mr. Flavin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here to participate in this uh, historic event this morning and to represent in some small way the state legislatures uh, in the United States. Um, we were watching you earlier on C-SPAN, which is carried in uh, legislative offices here in the Capitol and the State Office Building, and uh, enjoyed some of the discussion that took place earlier. Uh, your committee uh, asked me to talk about uh, some of the plans, trends, and innovations uh, that are evolving here in the Senate and in the state legislature uh, regarding legislative information technology. And, I, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'd like to say that uh, <coughs> high speed data communication. Uh oh. We have a legislative website. Is that our censor who's doing that? <laughs> Many meetings and agendas. And uh, we also, uh, in 1994, 
Minnesota, along with California, posted up to the minute election returns on the internet on election night and the next morning. In uh, the area of television, we have increased live coverage of floor sessions and committee meetings uh, that are on a PBS broadcast uh, channel, Channel 17, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, with uplinks to satellite uh, broadcast to Greater Minnesota and cable that reaches 81% of the households in the state. We also have increased coverage of conference committees. We use video conferencing, interactive uh, committee hearings, and the use of in-house produced videos for a variety of training purposes. On the question of whether these plans, trends, and innovations mirror those of other states, uh, I guess I would say that uh, here in Minnesota, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we lead in some areas and lag in others, but we are one of the states that is willing to experiment in new technology. In television, we are early adopters. We began live coverage of floor sessions and committee meetings in 1988. Many of the states who have not used television are beginning to use it, and many of the states uh, that uh, have used it in the past are actually expanding their hours of coverage. I might suggest for a complete picture uh, of what is going on in the states that uh, you and other people who are interested get a copy of the uh, Guide to Legislative Information Technology, which is published by the National Conference of State Legislatures in Denver. Uh, Bill Pound and his staff at NCSL would be glad to assist you. Uh, they have uh, a staff there that works with all of the state legislatures on technology questions. Well, one of the other things that uh, we have discussed is how well the elected members of the Senate and House adjust to the utilization of new information technologies. Uh, the leadership here and the members have supported the utilization of emerging technologies and have been willing to budget for it. And that has brought us a long way. Uh, the support that we have enjoyed has really enabled us to break into new areas. In computers, uh, some members uh, have now been trained and are using PCs themselves in their offices, and others utilize it through their staffs. But all of the members here expect us to provide the best information at the fastest possible speed because we have time pressures in that legislatures can only meet for a set period of time uh, during the year. Uh, in television, uh, virtually all members have adjusted to the fact that we cover so much by the coverage, but if we did have many who were skeptical about the need for coverage and the cost of it when we first initiated it. These changes have brought about uh, behavioral and cultural changes in the institution. Uh, I think that uh, in the area of computers, more and more members are taking training on our software packages, and uh, many have become very proficient at it. Uh, I think that very often we say that whether or not uh, members and staff adapt to this new technology depends uh, on age and whether or not the person really is uh, willing to try new technology. But we found that age is not always the determining factor. Uh, we have uh, many members who have been here a long time who are really getting into it. And, uh, and of course, we have uh, some of the new members who are coming in who are used to computer technology and their other lives that are adapting to it and using it all the time. But uh, we get more requests for data and more uh, requests for detailed data and making decisions. Uh, one of the things that Congressman Ehlers referred to was paper, and I have to say that uh, paper usage is reduced in some areas, but increases overall in spite of uh, uh, a wide variety of computer technology that we have. Uh, by the way, I, I enjoyed uh, Congressman Ehler's comments, and I agree with uh, almost everything that he said in the, in the area of computer usage. I think that uh, uh, maybe his background in the, in the Michigan legislature has uh, shaped some of his views, and uh, I think that the things that he's talked about there shows that uh, you're on the right track. Uh, in the area of television, as far as uh, members adjusting, uh, members pretty much forget the cameras are present uh, most of the time, but we have found out that constituents are watching, and they call in to express their feelings on the issues being considered on our television coverage, and so we know that people out there are watching. I think in general, uh, the impact of television on this legislature has been that more citizens are aware 
of what's going on in the legislature and the issues before the legislature. And this has resulted in more citizen lobbying by phone and by fax and by email. And for members and the public, uh, the more we do in technology, the more we raise expectations that we can do more and produce more. And uh, consequently, there's an expectation that more and better information will always be made available. And that's, that's something that we have to face. Uh, as you referred to, Mr. Chairman, I think the cost of some of this is always a question in an era of tight budgets. But there is a demand for it uh, on the part of the public, and uh, that is a cultural change. Uh, your staff also asked me to talk about uh, the, uh, what uh, impact uh, and public perception of the legislature has changed as a result of all of this. And I think what we found is the citizens who use uh, the technology and see the results of that utilization have a clearer perception of what the legislature is doing and a generally positive reaction to it. Uh, I think that uh, there will always be some who are skeptical, uh, but I do think that, uh, that it has been a generally positive reaction. Uh, we get feedback from people all the time, and senators and representatives tell me that they get feedback from people who have seen uh, the television coverage and have used our material on the Internet. Another question uh, that comes up very often is, what has been the impact of information technology utilization on staff resources? Uh, I think the answer to that is that staff uh, are more productive and better informed. Uh, it has not, however, reduced the number of staff. Um, the extent to which uh, staff and the members benefit and the institution benefits is directly correlated to the amount of training and the staff and members receive on some of this new technology. Uh, we found that training is, uh, is the absolute uh, determinant here of how well uh, this technology is used and what benefit from, that we get from it. Uh, we also uh, addressed the question of what are some of the practical lessons uh, that the Congress might pick up from our experience in the legislatures. And I would say uh, there are a few items that really are crucial. Uh, that is to uh, standardize software, uh, conduct needs assessments, train users on every new piece of software that's uh, made available, evaluate the results of the usage of the software, uh, keep current on the emerging technologies, and examine the effects of change on users and the public. And the last thing would be to assure uh, those who are concerned that technology is not a fearful monster, but is a valuable resource for the legislative process and does have a lot of benefits. Thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity for an opening statement, and I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have in the next uh, hour or so. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate your being here, and that came through very clearly uh, here in the hearing room. Uh, I'm now uh, pleased to call on my uh, good friend, Dr. Jeffrey Eisenach, who's president, senior fellow, and co-founder of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. He served as a senior economist at the Federal Trade Commission and in the Reagan administration's Office of Management and Budget. He also worked at the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Hudson Institute, and uh, his real claim to fame is that he's an alumnus of Claremont McKenna College. Jeff, we're happy to uh, welcome you. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for having me here, members of the committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I will try to keep my uh, comments short. I should indicate that I'm testifying on my own behalf, not on behalf of the foundation uh, of which I am president. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank uh, Kent Lastman, who is with me today and as a researcher for his help in preparing uh, today's testimony. What I'd like to do, and we'll do so more briefly than uh, in my written statement, uh, is to address what I believe are uh, four potentially dangerous myths about the impact of the information revolution on Congress and, and on government in general. The first of those myths is that the information age will make government and therefore Congress less important. The second is that the information age will enhance the functioning of mass democracy as we now understand it. The third is that the information age will make Congress in its present form work more efficiently. <clears throat> and the third is that questions of how to structure Congress and the legislative process are mostly internal issues about how Congress operates and really have little to do with the larger question of restructuring government. Let me address those one at a time. First and briefly, the argument that the information age is going to make government less important, I believe, is misguided. 
I believe it will make government less hierarchical. I believe it will make government smaller. I believe it will make government less centralized. But I do not believe it will make it less important, either the federal government or the Congress in particular. It will not be less important because many markets which are currently state or local or regional markets are now becoming na nationwide markets. The telecommunications legislation, uh, legislation now moving through Congress on electric utility regulation are just two examples of markets which we previously have regarded as regional or statewide markets and which clearly now need to be addressed on a national basis. Secondly, Inter many markets which have previously been national markets are now becoming international markets, requiring the Congress and the federal government to develop approaches and negotiate uh, appropriate uh, institutional arrangements with foreign countries. Third, as society becomes more complex and diverse, the federal government, as the expression of our national democratic process, will be challenged to devise institutional arrangements which permit and enhance freedom while, sharing, while preserving our shared principles. I also think these arguments about the role of government are, are, are wrong because the challenge before us is not simply to tear down an industrial age government which most now agree is obsolete. The challenge, and it is a complex and difficult challenge, is to replace that government with one which is arguably more simple but also needs to be made appropriate for a very complex time and that is a very difficult task. Richard Epstein's recent book, Simple Rules for a Complex World, addresses the challenge uh, that now faces the Congress. Uh, and I would also point out that you all are uh, privileged uh, and challenged to be members of Congress at a uh, very interesting time in our history. Just as the progressives uh, came of age in the era of the New Deal, and enacted legislation which in a very pro profound way uh, created and influenced our society right up through the present day and will for our history long into the future. You live in a time in which we move from an industrial age into an information age and the decisions that you make will have long run impact. So I think Congress is, if anything, more important now uh, as, a, as a result of the information revolution and government in general, while it may become smaller and less centralized, will also become, I believe, more important. Secondly, the information age will enhance the functioning of mass democracy. I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding and it's maybe the most pervasive misunderstanding that, that I see in terms of taking calls from the press and talking with people in general. The notion is that the information age in general and the internet in particular will uh, allow people to participate more in the functioning of, uh, of Congress and at the level of macro decisions being made by Congress because we can all watch Congress on C-SPAN and access copies of bills on Thomas and send email to our representatives about how we feel. We'll all be more empowered as citizens. Uh, Congress conversely will be better informed and more responsive to us because of all the email we send them. Uh, and as a result, Congress will make more decisions ever more effectively and, and more wisely. Uh, I think this myth is uh, somewhat ridiculous on its face, frankly. Uh, first, information about the activities of Congress has been widely available for many years, and while C-SPAN and Thomas make it easier to obtain raw data about what Congress is doing, anyone who's ever listened to a floor debate or tried to read a bill knows that raw data is not, is not always all that useful. Second, and more to the point, the notion that email on the internet is going to give every American their own direct line to their representative is simply silly. No human being can have 550,000 pen pals. And whether the mail shows up via snail mail or a T1 line doesn't change that simple fact. Congress already has good data through surveys and focus groups and so on and so forth about what the public believes and the fact that uh, constituent mail now shows up on an internet message instead of uh, through the U.S. Postal Service I don't think is a very fundamental change. I do think that the ability for individuals to participate more directly is, is potentially dangerous and it's already been mentioned today in the sense that because we could have direct representative democracy, we might choose to have it. Uh, I think that is uh, potentially very dangerous for the following reason, and that is that Congress is, the problem facing Congress is not that it has, is not that it doesn't have enough information, it's that it has too many decisions uh, before it. And the Tofflers uh, talk about this, and I quote them in my testimony, uh, to make a long story short, they conclude that uh, in Washington today, Congress and the White House are racing, trying to make too many decisions about too many fast-changing, complex things they know too little about. 
And I would argue that imposing that same decision load on 260 million people instead of 535 is no answer to the problem. Instead, what we need is to create what the Tofflers refer to as decision division, what I would call virtual democracy, and that is a plethora of regional, local, state, county, and in many cases, not even geographically based governmental institutions. And Congress needs to become part, if you will, of a seamless web of all of those governing institutions sitting at the pinnacle, if you will, but interacting with those representative institutions, interacting with those communities, not trying to interact one by one with 260 million Americans. That won't work. And it creates, uh, I think, an illusion of engagement uh, which uh, ultimately will lead to disillusionment because people will realize that the mail they get back over the internet uh, is in fact no more personalized than the mail that uh, frequently comes off of congressional computers today. Um, the third myth <clears throat> that uh, I'd like to address is that the information age will make Congress in its present form work more efficiently. To make a long story short, I think it is true that Congress needs to move rapidly to adopt uh, and put in place the information technologies that are now available. Uh, I think that could have been done more rapidly in the past, and I think the fact that you all, and Mr. Ehlers in, uh, in particular, and you all in this hearing are moving so rapidly to do that is essentially important. I do think that it is important that, to understand that uh, technology is not a replacement for structural change. Uh, General Motors uh, in 1960 with computers would not be an efficient firm. General Motors is a fundamentally different company today from what it was in 1960. Uh, and if you go through example after example after example where uh, companies, private sector companies, have brought in technology with the notion that they would do everything they're presently doing the way they're now doing it, but do it faster, uh, that has proven to be a dangerous illusion. Uh, I would note very briefly and do in this section in my written statement, uh, that I believe the question of remote voting is one that really ought to be considered. Uh, I, I have some familiarity with the schedules of members, the stresses that are placed upon them, uh, and uh, while I think it is essentially important that members uh, congregate in Washington on occasion and perhaps congregate in other places uh, on occasion, I think uh, that the ability to vote from remote locations, the ability to not be dragged across the street three, four, five, six uh, times a day, uh, is one that ought to be uh, seriously considered and would not only make Congress persons' lives uh, easier, but would allow for a lot more productive uh, role. Uh, fourth and finally, the, questions of, the notion that questions of how to structure Congress and the legislative process are mostly internal issues and don't have much to do with the larger uh, question of restructuring government, I think is another myth, and I think it'd be hard to find anybody to defend that myth, but uh, until at least 1995, relatively little attention uh, has been paid to the question of restructuring Congress, uh, and that suggests that uh, implicitly, at least, uh, the question of restructuring Congress and its relationship to restructuring government has received less attention uh, than uh, I believe it needs. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, the, the uh, phenomenon of, uh, of, of power in Washington uh, expressed through the committee structure uh, with each committee corresponding to an agency or group of agencies, a power base in the executive branch, uh, makes it very, very difficult to make the kinds of changes in the executive branch uh, that uh, I think we all agree need to be made or most people agree need to be made. Uh, and I think that as you look at the question of restructuring uh, Congress, you need to look at that in the context of how a restructured virtual Congress, if you will, uh, would match up with a restructured virtual executive branch. Uh, and one of those, one of the things that I mentioned in my testimony in particular is I think looking at the committee structure much more as a moving picture rather than a static picture is one that ought to be considered. The enhanced use of task forces uh, is something that uh, I know the speaker has uh, uh, worked with some this year and last year. Uh, I think that that uh, experience, while it, it has worked in some cases arguably and not uh, worked as well in others, uh, I think that that experience will prove very valuable as you think about restructuring Congress in the future and the ability to create a task force, take on a task, complete the task, and dissolve the task force and move on to the next task uh, is one that is enabled by the information age because of the fact that you can work virtually, you can work through teleconferencing, you can work through the internet, uh, and you don't need to set up a large committee room, uh, a suite of offices, and so on and so forth in order to get the job done anymore. 
Uh, let me uh, just conclude with one quotation from a book called The Virtual Corporation, uh, written by William Davidow and Michael Malone. Uh, they conclude that the virtual corporation, quote, in the end, unlike its contemporary predecessors, will appear less a discrete enterprise and more an ever-varying cluster of common activities in the midst of a vast fabric of relationships. I'd like to suggest that that sentence applied to the U.S. Congress is worthy of your consideration. A virtual Congress will be more fluid and flexible internally. It will be more dynamic in its decision making and increasingly will be woven almost seamlessly into a vast fabric of relationships that will constitute the American political system. Information technology makes that possible, uh, but it is the efforts of you and your colleagues, Mr. Chairman, who will make it real, uh, and I want to encourage you and your efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. We appreciate that. And as you well know, we in the 104th Congress have brought about some very sweeping change in structural reform. Uh, I had a hand in uh, restructuring the committees, the, the greatest changes we've seen in half a century, and we're in the process today of reviewing those with a, a task force that has been put together under the Speaker's direction to review the, the changes that we've made and see what impact they're having on the legislative process as we proceed to the 105th Congress. So we appreciate that. You've raised a lot of very uh, important uh, questions, and I look forward to our getting into those during the discussion. Finally, uh, I'd like to call on Professor Stephen Franzik, who is chair of the Department of Political Science at the U.S. Naval Academy. He's written widely on the social organization and political impact of technology on political institutions. As the president of Congressional Data Associates, he served as a consultant to the Congress and a variety of foreign legislatures. His latest book, The C-SPAN Revolution, is due for publication by the University of Oklahoma Press this summer. We look forward to that and uh, recognize you as one of the very few people who has actually written and got in depth into all the technological changes taking place in legislatures. We're very pleased to have you with us, Professor. And if you could summarize so that we can get into discussion, we look forward to that. Sure. Thank you. Let me start out by complimenting the committee for looking at the social, political, and organizational impacts of technology. In, in 25 years of looking at this, I've seen Congress only sporadically worrying about the, the impact. They've rushed off into technology or they've avoided technology without thinking about the implications. So I compliment the committee for, for looking at this. We're talking today primarily about information technologies, which is appropriate because uh, information processing is the core technology of Congress. Congress doesn't produce anything you know, of substance. They don't produce widgets. They, they produce information. They manipulate information. I'm using manipulate in a, in a neutral sense. Uh, they're at the vortex of three information flows. Uh, as a representative body, they are receivers of information. As a deliberative body, they are transmitters of information among the members and the constituent units. And as a public institution, they are disseminators of information, of committee reports, congressional record, legislation, those sorts of th things. So if we're talking about the core technology of an institution, the likelihood it's going to have an impact is, is much greater than if we're talking at the margin someplace. I believe Congress has to walk a fine line when it looks at adopting technology. On one hand, it's got to avoid the kind of uncritical enthusiasm that we've got to try it because it's, it's there. The law of the instrument, or, or more simply stated, if, if you give a child a hammer, the whole world becomes a nail. Uh, that's dangerous. Uh, on the other end, they have to avoid the kind of entrenched hanging on to the past of saying, well, we've never done it that way before, and Thomas Jefferson didn't use television, and we're not going to use uh, uh, television. Somewhere in the middle, there's what I would call a demand-driven uh, approach. That is, take a look at what the demands are. What are our needs today? What are the problems? What can't we solve? How can technology move in and help us solve those particular problems? All the time, leaving uh, the opportunity for what I call the unlocking effect. Congress doing something it hasn't done in the past, or members doing something they haven't been done in the past because it was technologically uh, not feasible. We have to recognize that specific technologies, the kind of things we're talking about today, television, digitized television, the internet, email, computers, fax machines, all of those sorts of things, affect who gets what information, when, and how. We have to look at the specific technologies, but we also have to realize there's a general pattern here. The technologies that we're looking at, first of all, tend to increase the speed and efficiency by which we get information. They tend to increase the ability to find and retrieve information. They reduce, as we've seen this morning, the limits of time and space. And they change the substance of, of what is transmitted and who controls what is received in the process. Now, we can look at a number of impacts that have already become evident in Congress. Let me just roll through a couple of these here. 
one process. We've seen it this morning with video conferencing. We have changed the ability of who could participate and what the impact was on their work schedule. Again, I compliment the committee. It's easy to talk the talk. We've tried to walk the walk this morning in terms of technology. We've had a couple of glitches, uh, not major ones. But we have to recognize that that is some of the costs of going in the new technology area. So there are process implications. There are power implications. You know, Congress is a political institution where power is important. Uh, speaker Gingrich probably wouldn't be speaker today, and Mr. Dreyer probably wouldn't be chair of this committee if it weren't for the fact that a decade ago, Speaker Gingrich and a number of his colleagues learned how to use C-SPAN, learned how to use special orders, learned how to use television to get their message uh, across. So technology changes power for those people who are willing to use it creatively. Uh, technology changes structure. Uh, Twenty years ago, less than 10 percent of congressional staffs were in uh, the district offices. Today, 40 percent or so of congressional staffs. They couldn't have done that if it weren't for the computer, for uh, the fax machine. Those sorts of technologies allow them to be full operatives. You know, when I first started looking at Congress, if you are in a district office, that was Siberia. You were totally out of, out of touch. Today, you are sometimes more, than touch, more in touch than the people who are right down the hall from the, uh, the member. So there are structural aspects. There are also policy aspects. We've had some discussion this morning already of Internet-created discussion groups, Internet-created interest groups out there who organize almost instantaneously and push for against certain piece of legislation. So it changes the outcome in the policy uh, process. Congress's role has always been one of establishing institutional and social priorities for our society. And I think it has to do the same when it comes to information technology and its use of information technologies. Let me suggest a couple of goals or a couple of priorities. One is I think Congress has an important responsibility to remain uh, as an effective disseminator and user of information. Congress can't get bypassed. The separation of powers pro process should not be diluted because of information technology. So in, Congress has to be in the middle of this information flux. flux. Now, secondly, Congress has to look at some of the possibilities for increasing efficiency. And we've already talked about print on demand and some of these sorts of things that can save some, uh, some money in the process. And I think more important to me is that uh, Congress has to use technology in a way that it evens the political playing field rather than exacerbating some of the inequalities in the, in the process so that we have a wider spread of information out there, a wider group of people that can be uh, involved. It can be involved in a timely manner. In politics, information de delayed is information denied. If you don't get it for a week or a month and everybody else who is a key actor gets it immediately, I'm concerned, for example, the congressional voting uh, is now electrified, but you cannot get it for 24 hours. Find out how your individual member voted. I think we need to change that, uh, that rule so there can be direct, direct access. I'm concerned that the committees have a fair amount of control of what they disseminate and when they disseminate it, and there is not a one-stop shopping. As wonderful as Thomas is, there are a number of gaps in that information safety net where people can't get information in a timely uh, manner. Very important that we plan. Technologies don't impact on organizations like two ships colliding at night. There's no inexorable kind of a calculation of what the impact is going to be. They get transmitted through the various traditions and the goals of the organization that's involved. So we have to look at it in the context of, of Congress. I think it's important for us to look at it because organizations which plan and look at the potential impact have a much higher likelihood of being able to guide that impact in a positive direction rather than all of a sudden waking up one morning and finding out the technology is there and we haven't thought about the consequences. Well, those are very general comments. Uh, I look forward to some of the discussion we will have uh, this morning. I also look forward to both agreeing and disagreeing with some of my colleagues and the things they've said. Thank you very much, Professor. We appreciate your uh, very helpful testimony and the, and the uh, quarter of century work that you've, uh, effort you've put into this. We are uh, hearing from the Internet, and uh, we've heard from Jim Warren of Woodside, California, on uh, email, who says, any documents prepared by congressional staff or members using a word processor should be placed on free public access congressional Internet file servers. Uh, he goes on to say, technology now makes it possible to empower representative democracy by allowing citizens the option of being fully and timely informed. Please do so. Uh, why don't we uh, go right now to uh, our colleague Scott McGinnis, who has not been with us for a few minutes. Are you still out there in space, Scott? You'll have to oh, speak up. Right, and Mr. Th there you are. 
Uh, do you, uh, Chairman, that's correct. Do you have any, uh, any... This microphone, I'm afraid I'm going to eat it. Okay, good. Okay, well, we've just zoomed in on you there, Scott. Uh, Mr. Is... Chairman, uh, the comments that we've heard from the witnesses I felt were uh, particularly useful. Uh, it, it is interesting. I think we're going to see a debate uh, in, in the future to see whether we should have remote voting. But let me stress again the opportunity that this has allowed us out in rural America or out in America outside the Beltway to participate. You know, I didn't even, uh, and never was able to set foot in the United States Capitol until the year that I ran for election to the U.S. Congress. And this kind of allows us to step inside your chambers there, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and bring it home. And as I mentioned earlier, for a district this size, what we did years ago was uh, really in our districts to go to college, you had to go to the population centers. Now we have our community college system, like the Pueblo Community College, and to go and participate in politics, you had to go to the population center. So I think there are huge advantages now that we're reaching out, much as we did with the community college system. We're now reaching out into America. I think that there is an issue. I can say that the, the advancement of email in our offices, we, our, my particular office, Mr. Chairman, looked at email. We certainly have the computer capability. The difficulty we found was that we would increase, we thought, by a factor of 30 to 40 percent the amount of inflow to our, our offices. Now, in our offices, we get about 1,000 pieces of mail a day in the four district offices here in Colorado and the office in Washington. Our concern was that we did not have the staff capability to respond to the email. And we, as, as you, Mr. Chairman, and as my colleagues sitting there, know that we try, all of us, try and respond to, to the mail that we get in. So I think, actually, the increased participation will act, uh, will increase staff requirements. So there are going to be costs involved, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm about to, uh, I'm going to have to uh, excuse myself from the committee, but because uh, I'm going to get back and head into the mountains. But I do want to tell you thank you very much for allowing us here from Colorado to participate, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week, and I can't help but put a plug in. Uh, we still have great snow out here, so we <laughs> want to uh, all you people from California to continue to spend your money out here in Colorado. But then okay. after you're done spending your money, we want you to go back home. Mr. Okay. Yeah, we understand that, Scott. Uh, we appreciate your being here. Let me ask, Scott, before you leave, um, you said that you had projected that there would be uh, a 30 to 40 percent increase with email. Has that, in fact, been the case? Switch me back. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, but they didn't, uh, another technical problem, they didn't switch on back there and I couldn't uh, read your lips fast. Okay. I, I, was, uh, I was just asking, Scott, if you had in fact seen a 30 to 40 percent increase in the inflow because of the use of email uh, in your office. You said you had projected that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that's a projection based on the number of inquiries we've had from the district and when we talk to people about would they utilize it, the response was pretty, an, a pretty strongly overwhelming yes. But we felt that if we were not able to respond to these individual emails, that we would have a lot of disappointed folks. It's kind of like in Colorado years ago, Mr. Chairman, when I sat on the Colorado Tourism Board, we put in a 1-800 number to assist tourists who would like to come to Colorado. And we found that we were immediately, immediately got an overflow into the 1-800 number, and we had a lot of people that were very upset by the fact not that we offered a 1-800 number, but by the fact that every time they called, they got a busy signal. And so it really ended up kind of being a disaster for us. So I think we're going to have to very carefully allocate staff because we still have to maintain the ability to respond individually to our constituents. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And Dr. May, we appreciate... Uh, you can have to switch on a mic for me, Mr. Chairman. I cannot... my, my mic is switched on. Uh, it's, uh, can you hear me now, thank Scott? Thank you. I hear you okay. now. I well, hear you now. I was saying something nice about you, uh, and so, yeah. And at, <clears throat> no, no, I usually leave it off if I have something. It was a very brief comment, though, Scott. Um, let me thank Dr. May and those at Pueblo Community College, and to say that that uh, our colleague, Mr. Bielenson, would like to uh, raise a question with you, Scott. Tony, it's not so much a, a question as a, as a couple of little statements. One is that uh, it, it it's nice that you're out there in Pueblo. It, it evokes some some memories. In, uh, in me. I spent a night in, in Pueblo back in 1954 when I was uh, hitchhiking around the country and was a 
nice little town at the time. It's probably 10 times as large now. But the other thing I want to say is this. Um, our friend Mr. McInnes is... I was born, by the way. Yeah, a little before you were born. The, um, <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to say is this. For, to my colleagues who, don't, who may not know it, our, our friend and colleague Mr. McInnes represents what may be the most beautiful the beautiful district, most beautiful district in the country. Our family on two occasions has had the opportunity to take week-long or to actually 10-day-long horseback trips up both in the La Garita wilderness and the Wimanuchi uh, wilderness. And why do I say this? It's only because these are beautiful places, Mr. Chairman, and, and for those eight to 10 days, we were, we were literally up there above 11,000 feet. We never saw another single human being who was not in our group. That appeals to me a lot more, not being able to hear from millions of people as in, con in, in contrast to what it is that we're talking about today, where 550,000, 600,000 people will be at us with email or whatever, I think my, our friend uh, uh, Scott did, did the right thing in not, in not starting this email stuff. Uh, we'd be inundated with, uh, with messages, and I think it's uh, nice to be able to, to appreciate and, and to be in, in, in a district such as his and not have to have our constituents get at us all the time. You know what I mean, Scott? Well, you've made a very clear statement on the process of deliberative democracy. Uh, Tony Scott. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want again allow thank you for the participation. And again, as I said, here I'm able to participate there. And now I'm off to uh, go into the district and cover another uh, a number of events. But thank you very much. I want to thank the witnesses and thank my good friend, Mr. Bielinson. He is always welcome to the high mountains of Colorado. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and thanks again to all at Pueblo Community College. Uh, Porter? Do you uh, have any further comments? Very briefly, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the observation I have about the email is that uh, we opted not to put it on our home page after checking with members who had put it on their home page. We just simply don't have the resources to deal with it. But um, the, the other uh, question that comes up, uh, something that was triggered in the comments that it was, I think this is going to go well beyond just the structure and the way we do business in Congress. Everybody knows there is a silent partner involved in this town called politics, uh, organized party politics, not so silent sometimes. And it seems to me that if every word that we write or speak is always going to be available, as uh, the last uh, email that you just heard and read, it uh, seems to me opponent research is going to take on new meanings uh, and matters like political correctness are going to be redefined, uh, and it is going to be a very interesting world. It's going to literally put you on stage all the time, uh, as if you're in front of cameras all the time, and everything you do and write is going to have to be explained. Uh, and and I, I wonder how we are going to handle that, because people are sometimes so willing to take things out of context in order to score a political point. I, and particularly in this atmosphere, I think that's an observation that's worth noting. No, that, that is. Uh, from the Internet, we have a, a question that uh, we're still hearing from Colorado. Grand Junction, Colorado, uh, has raised a question which I would like to pose to the witnesses. Uh, ben uh, Gagnon of Grand Junction has said, uh, do you believe that having representatives participate via technology rather than in person would make it easier for them to avoid difficult questions or discussions, either by claiming technical difficulties or remaining silent. Vern? The latter is an impossibility. I've never known a politician to remain silent. Uh, claiming technical difficulties, I don't think that would be a, a factor. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't see that impacting on this at all. It's, Many of these issues, uh, it's just a matter of getting used to. I, I, you know, some of the reservations I've heard expressed about the remote meetings, remote conferencing, uh, the computer use and so forth, uh, remind me of some of the articles I read from approximately 100 years ago about the use of the telephone. And I recall uh, reading, specifically reading an article about some representatives who refused to have telephones installed in their offices when they first became available. Uh, it, um, maybe there are some today who would like to, <laughs> like to deinstall their telephones, but it's a lifeline at this point. It, and as, as Jeff said earlier, there's really no difference between email and snail mail. Uh, the only increase in volume we've observed in our office, and I've been on the internet ever since I got here, uh, the only increase in volume has been the fact that there are some people in this world who, when they write their congressperson, 
decide that since they've taken the trouble of writing uh, on the internet, they might as well send it to every congressman. And it's just as easy to do that. You know, you simply enter all the names and you make it a habit of sending them. So we get a lot more mail from outside the district. But from within the district, there has not been an appreciable change. It's just that people are getting it delivered faster than they used to have it delivered. Uh, Secretary Flavin, uh, do you have any comments at all? We want to make sure that you're still part of this discussion. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that uh, the use of uh, electronics and uh, email in particular uh, have allowed constituents to get to their members uh, in a different way. Uh, one of the, the cautionary notes, I guess, that, that I could say, based on our experience, is that uh, lobbying organizations also have discovered the, uh, the world of technology, and many times our fax machines and our email uh, our receivers are, uh, are uh, clogged with um, uh, messages uh, from organized lobbying efforts and are not always simply generated by individual constituents expressing uh, deeply held uh, concerns. So I think that uh, that, that has to be uh, evaluated in the whole, the whole process. But uh, in spite of that, uh, maybe one downside, uh, I think that legislative experience would be that we ought to embrace these things and use them for the value they can bring to us. I uh, would like to, to raise uh, a question that has really come from, from virtually everyone here, and, and that is bringing up the point uh, that was made earlier. The, the view in the mid-1970s was that by televising the proceedings of the Congress, the American people would understand and have a very high regard for what it is that has gone on in this institution. We all know that the opposite has been the case. And so we're, we're faced with this struggle of trying to ensure that we have uh, uh, greater input from the American people and at the same time that they have more exposure to what it is that we're doing here. And as we have seen greater exposure, uh, we have seen a diminution of the support level for the institution. And I wonder uh, what concerns you all think we should have and, and how we would strike a balance on that. I've looked at the, the poll figures, and you know, Congress certainly went into the whole television process by saying, to know us is to love us. And uh, as we know, it's become familiarity breeds contempt in terms of if you, if you read the kind of first surface of the poll results. But if you look more carefully, the people who are heavy viewers of congressional tel uh, television are relatively sophisticated. They are not so much packs on, on both your houses, but it's, well, we don't like this is what's going on, that is what's going, going on. There's kind of room for improvement. So I guess you, you know, the, the school marm in me says, clean up your act and, and, and you'll be liked. Uh, I think that's too simplistic. But the people who are, are watching are very carefully saying, I want to judge performance. And uh, I'm going to leave open uh, how positive I'm going to view the institution and its members. So there's some, some room for hope in that, uh, in that process. Were you going to say? Well, I was just going to, in response to that particular um, observation of yours, Mr. Chairman, I think it, it's, it's, it's a result to a certain extent, if I may say so, and I, I, I'm trying not to be partisan here, I'm trying to be very careful, but in all seriousness, uh, when people did have access to television, to C-SPAN, and started watching us, um, they started hearing what we were saying about ourselves, among other things. And there have been certain members in this place, I shan't men mention any, any, uh, any names, who've, who've made it their business over the past few years, members from both parties, who attack the process, attack one another, and so on, and, and to a certain extent, people pick up on that. If we, if, we, um, if we didn't have that kind of, of discussion going on, if, for example, we didn't have these one minutes, I mean, just my own personal pet peeve at the beginning of the, of the day, which I find offensive from both sides, quite frankly, and had, had television coverage only of the debates uh, between committee members on particular bills and amendments, I think most of that debate is quite civilized, quite thoughtful, and I think people come away from watching that feeling quite, quite good about, about what they see back here. But if they tune in and, and, they, and they spend the, the first 30 minutes of each day hearing members from each side attack the other side, attack the president, you know, whether it's a Republican president or a Democratic president or whatever, everybody kind of comes away from it with a with, you know, kind of a bad feeling about the process, as, as in fact we do when we tune in and watch some of our colleagues uh, lambaste one another. Porter would like to be recognized for one minute in light of your uh, <laughs> remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I agree with uh, my colleague from California that there has been a loss of comity. Uh, and uh, I think that the, sometimes uh, the debate gets very passionate. 
and uh, sometimes it is uh, the debate is more engineered to, to score political points than it is to do anything else. And I think that probably is, is uh, inappropriate for the use of the public's resources in the House. I would say I have tried to understand why we, how our approval ratings move around. And it seems to me that there is much perception involved in that. Things like congressional pay raises and issues have a lot to do with that. But it is puzzling what a low approval rating the institution has when the fact that so many incumbents do get reelected, so many members of Congress actually have quite a high uh, approval rating with the people they work for, that is the people of their district. But I would make two observations, Tony. One is it is a well-known fact that you don't want to watch legislation being made any more than you want to watch sausage being made. It's, it's not necessarily an attractive process. There is a lot of give and take. And the second thing I would say is this democracy, only 200 years old, has probably done a better job than any other place in the world of doing legislation. Many other places in the world are still settling their differences using weapons and guns. I think we do pretty darn well just with words, although I agree there are days we should, we should clean up some of the statements we make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, uh, from the Internet, uh, have another statement here, and then I would like to call on you, Jeff. And actually, this gets along uh, the line of some of your testimony. This is from uh, Ira Hiley. doesn't say uh, where Ira is from. I think this form of Internet participation will eventually end the big government and the waste known as Washington, D.C. We will go back to the days when Congress worked only a portion of the year, not a lifetime job. Jeff. As I say, I, I think the role that Congress has to play, certainly for the coming decade or two, and, and frankly, I believe, into the future, uh, is one of greater importance, not less importance. Uh, I think it's greater importance in the short run because of the need to not just tear down or reduce the size of the federal government that we now have, but to create a set of replacement institutions and laws uh, and frameworks that allow markets to operate and that enhance personal freedom. And that's, I think, a very challenging task. Uh, what I do think the Internet uh, and the information revolution more broadly permit uh, is a much more complex, integrated, and uh, uh, widespread uh, uh, spreading out of the powers of government. I think what you have is the ability to actually get to communities the power to make decisions that primarily affect those communities while at the same time having the communications and networking capability so that when those decisions do have impacts on neighboring communi communities or on the nation as a whole, that those impacts can be taken into account in a much more complex way uh, than they are today. I think, that's, uh, I think that will occur. Uh, as for how Congress operates, uh, I do think that it is important that Congress, uh, A, be in a position to interact with the much more complex and uh, integrated uh, system of governance, which will be lots of different institutions in lots of different places, uh, as opposed to talking mostly to itself. Uh, and, uh, and I do think that that means getting out of Washington more. Uh, I do think that that will be uh, one of the consequences. Uh, and, and as I say, I think the, if you look at days in session uh, by the U.S. Congress, compare it with state legislatures or days in session with the U.S. Congress and compare it with historical times, uh, comity and personal interactions uh, do not require uh, being, uh, I don't believe, being in session uh, as much as Congress currently is in session. I think Congress will always want to meet uh, in person. But what, the, uh, what information technology will allow is for members, even if they are spread out into 435 districts uh, around the globe, around the country, uh, or for that matter, if, when, if traveling abroad, uh, to meet virtually uh, in a way which is fairly person to person. One comment I, I would like to make with respect to where we are presently, and that is, uh, as we've seen today, the technology that we are working with today is extraordinarily rudimentary relative to where we will be two years from now or four years from now or six years from now. And the ability to have very personal interaction. Uh, the wall behind me will in all likelihood be a full size, uh, wall size video screen five years from now, ten years from now, certainly can be. And the people sitting uh, in various places around the world will be as if they were in this room and there will be no dropouts uh, from uh, glitches in the internet. Uh, covered mountains of Colorado so as we, we will, uh, uh, if, if, we, if we choose to do so, it will be possible. There is uh, one, one particular uh, very specific issue where we've had some disagreement, and that has to do with the specific use of the voting card. And you're arguing, Jeff, that we should see members vote from their districts. And I, 
Uh, one of the hearings that we held earlier of this subcommittee, we, we talked about uh, this issue, and I think it was our friend Tom Mann from Brookings who raised the, the, uh, the following point. Can you imagine a member of Congress sitting in his or her district office and uh, not being faced simply with a lobbyist in the hallway of the Congress, but instead picketers outside of that door, uh, 50, 60 people who are raising cane on a particular issue as a member of Congress is getting ready to cast a vote on that question. I think that that in itself uh, raises a very interesting point. And I also believe that as we look at the issue of, uh, of non-controversial items, maybe there could be an agreement where we would have something like an electronic calendar, whereby those items that are non-controversial could be voted on, maybe you, you use the argument, Jeff, running across the street, from members' offices at that point. That might be some sort of compromise. But I, I uh, am one who concurs with Tony, and I have consistently argued that the personal interaction which does take place, and I talked about this earlier on C-SPAN this morning, on the floor of Congress and, and those who watch the wide-angle shots of C-SPAN see that there's interaction that takes place even while the debate is going on on the floor of the Congress uh, is, is a very important part of, of uh, legislating. Vern? If I may, I'd like to comment on a few uh, things you've said and that my fellow panelists have said. Before I do, I just want to also comment on uh, the first internet message you received, which came in from Jim Warren, and that was no surprise to me. Uh, I met him last summer, at the, and, and Jeff knows him as well. He was at the Aspen Institute, uh, not the Institute, but the Aspen Function, sponsored by the Freedom, Progress and Freedom Foundation. Jim, you may be interested to know, was the one who organized a, the first internet group in California to lobby on an issue, and managed to get a bill passed just by using the net as a means of notifying members who immediately called legislators' offices. And so he was the first one to successfully use the Internet in that process. I did, on the, on the issue of remote voting, that it's no surprise to me that uh, anyone outside the Congress would say, why don't you just vote from your offices? I think most of the members of Congress would say no. And there's a reason for that. We, are, we have to transact a lot of business with each other in a personal way. It is very, very difficult to reach each other. Typically, we may trade phone calls five or six times before we actually make contact. What the voting does is to say to everyone, stop what you're doing, go to the floor. And I think all of us go there with a three by five card filled with names of people we have to see and what we have to see them about. And if you watch closely, uh, from the galleries, you will see people looking around, scurrying around, finding the people. And this, you have all these ants chasing around, looking for specific other ants to discuss issues with. It's a very, very productive 15 minutes. Now, I would certainly agree with it, that we can make this more efficient if we do sometimes by grouping votes so we're not having our day interrupted too often. But sometimes I think it's a little bit like the British tea at 4 o'clock where no matter what organization you're in, four o'clock, you stop whatever you're doing, you go have tea, you meet with everyone in the building, everyone in the business, and you talk about issues. You don't have that opportunity otherwise, and that's basically what we do during the voting period. I, I do want to uh, comment, also Mr. Franchitz, I, th I think you have probably the most uh, perceptive observations I've heard from someone outside the Congress on the operation of Congress. And it's obvious you've been watching us for a long time, and I just want to register my appreciation. Also for uh, Mr. Eisenach, uh, the, the, I think the key issue you raised is one of restructuring. How should Congress restructure itself and perhaps restructure the federal government in view of technological advances? Now, what I've observed is that, that we're going in the wrong direction in the Congress and that we tend to be making, taking issues and making them more complex by writing these immense 2,000-page bills, which get referred to 17 different committees, and you have this tremendous process going on to try to deal with that. I think uh, one of the restructurings that would be effective is, and, and Congress, in fact, probably could meet less often if we did this, is to insist that bills had to address only certain specific parts. Of, of issues and deal with those directly. Uh, this is the way state legislatures still work. And uh, we spent much more time in general session than in committees at the state legislative level, but always on specific small bites that you could deal with 
in perhaps 10 or 15 minutes of debate, vote, get rid of it, pass it on, and most of the votes be unanimous in that case. And I, I think uh, that's just one example of the type of restructuring you're talking about. We, uh, we are tending to complexify issues today rather than simplify them, and I believe that's really hampered the efficient operation of Congress. And so we have these issues that, such as telecommun telecommunications reform, which hung on for some 15 years or so, whereas had it been addressed on an annual basis, just dealing with the issues that were pertinent at that time, we could have kept it updated every year. Uh, I, I, I don't know what other ideas of restructuring you have or that other members have, but I think that's really going to be the key to making adjustments to the future. The one is attempting to jump in here. Am I correct in uh, surmising that you? That's right, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to uh, address that issue that was talked about a few minutes ago about uh, why uh, do people still have a low uh, uh, impression of legislative institutions in spite of all we've done and all the public uh, affairs things that we've done in our television coverage. And I, I believe that uh, for those people who watch uh, the process, who watch the institution, they do have a better understanding and, uh, and at least a more informed judgment about the institution. And I think that it's uh, generally positive. I don't, I don't know that it, it changes, you know, everybody's opinion, but uh, in 1994, a Minneapolis cable survey indicated that 40% of the cable households tuned into some of the proceedings that we had on a controversial bill on nuclear waste storage here in the state. And that was a, a very controversial item, as they say, and, uh, and generated uh, a lot of legislative hearings and cul culminated in a, in a long conference committee. And uh, if 40% uh, of the cable households in Minneapolis watched uh, a part of that, and presumably uh, mostly the conference committee, uh, it really did a good job of educating citizens on the process. Also, during uh, 12 weeks in our recently completed 96 session, 3,000 viewers of the legislative coverage phoned in our comment line, and 73% of those calls were comments about the actual issues being discussed, and 21% of the callers uh, gave us favorable comments about the coverage itself uh, and hoped that the service would be continued. And to finish, uh, a sample size of 2,300 public television viewers, almost 20% listed our 30-minute uh, public affairs program is one of their favorite shows. Uh, so I think that uh, it may be more important to, uh, for us to say uh, we want to reach out to people and uh, whether or not they have a, a positive or negative uh, uh, view of the institution may be incidental to the fact that at least we are providing coverage that people want and that they will form those opinions uh, from that and uh, from uh, regular news sources. And I think we also have found that um, uh, people at least have a better view of their individual member, their senator or their house member. Uh, and so uh, at least if they know more about uh, that person, uh, or, or at least their senator and their house member, uh, what they think of the institution may be incidental to what they think about their own uh, members in the legislature or in the Congress. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Jeff? Just two or three comments. First, on the issue of transparency and, and the ability to uh, uh, see documents online and so on and so forth, and the implications of that for everyone having to be concerned about political correctness. The truth of the matter is, I suspect people are more concerned by what they don't know or think they don't know than what they do. Uh, and uh, in a completely transparent Congress, which is technologically possible, they wouldn't just see the line taken out of context, they'd see the letter of which it was a part, uh, the memoranda going back and forth describing the issue. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I think one of the fundamental uh, tenets of our democracy is that we can count on people to be informed and to make fair decisions, uh, ultimately. And I think more information ultimately has to be presumed to win out uh, over less and to be productive. Uh, I frankly don't see uh, much reason why the presumption shouldn't be in favor of complete openness, given that uh, that's now technologically possible. Uh, and the question ought to be which things would be restricted very much as the, Cong as the executive branch is subject to Freedom of Information Act. Uh, one question that comes out of that is whether uh, Freedom of Information Act exempt materials at the 
executive branch ought not be tagged at the time they are created and all other documents be instantaneously available. Why have to go through a six week or six month or two year process to get a document through the Freedom of Information Act when it could be available to you online instantaneously? Secondly, on the question of restructuring, I, I'm very much struck by what uh, Congressman Ayler said. Uh, I think that, uh, yes, in many cases it uh, should be possible to do incremental pieces of legislation uh, and perhaps those are the cases where it would be possible to vote uh, remotely. Uh, and, uh, but it is also true, I think, that uh, one of the challenges the Congress faces is to remake the large structures. Uh, of the uh, executive branch and that that does require an holistic approach. I think trying to do telecommunications, for example, piece by piece could have given you a mess as opposed to trying to take a comprehens comprehensive holistic approach to it. Maybe there is a way to distinguish between the holistic uh, macro reform uh, that needs to occur uh, and to do that uh, on the House floor, maybe more so even than is now the case. Uh, while uh, taking incremental uh, reform legislation and doing it uh, even on a remote basis. The third point I'd make is that I, I believe the most important structural reform uh, is, uh, is one that uh, is characterized by the simple word dynamic. Uh, what uh, is true is that, first of all, the structure of Congress is out of step with at least the future uh, structure of the federal government uh, and needs to be restructured. But secondly, the structure of the federal government probably needs to be more dynamic in the future than it has been in the past, and Congress uh, therefore uh, also needs to be uh, more dynamic. Uh, you all have already taken steps, uh, term limits on committee chairmen, uh, for example, to uh, end or reduce the ossification, uh, the uh, structural uh, lack of change. Uh, in the Congress, and I think further steps in that direction are the most uh, important single uh, structural reform. You ought to be able to take an issue, address it, uh, eliminate the institution that addressed the uh, issue and create a new institution to create, i.e. committee uh, or task force to address the next issue rather than being locked into committee structures that often grow out of date. And of course, your efforts, Mr. Chairman, uh, in terms of eliminating some of those committees that have been, her been around here for 20 or 30 years uh, after they were uh, arguably uh, and pretty clearly no longer needed uh, were the first major step in that direction. And the fact that you're continuing to move in that direction I think is very important. Professor Frenzik. Let me make, make two comments. One on the transparency uh, issue. Almost 200 years ago, there was a tremendous debate in the Senate about opening its public galleries. And they said, if we open the public galleries, it would be the death of the institution. And uh, 100 or so years later, the discussion on radio coming in it will be the death of the institution. And much of the discussion around the television chambers was the death of the in in institution. Well, uh, you're a pretty durable institution uh, with the onslaught of technologies. And so I think that uh, Jeff is right, that the presumption ought to be uh, openness unless there's an awfully good argument for you know, closing and not only openness, but a timeliness of the information to, to make it realistic in the, in the process. Uh, secondly, I guess I would disagree with Jeff uh, on... Continue to follow Bismarck's line, we will not watch sausage being made then. Right. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, it's not instructive to see sausage being ma made. I may not want to eat it after it's been, been, uh, been made. <laughs> uh, on the remote voting, I I'm concerned about uh, remote voting, and I think it would be a very narrow range of issues in which I'd be willing to accept remote voting on. We know, for example, that email is the phenomenon of flaming. You get on email and you can type that, that out and it's anonymous and you send it out to all sorts of people and you may say things that uh, you would not say in a face-to-face -face kind of setting. And since Congress is based on compromise and, and on issues over which reasonable people can disagree with good faith, I'd rather have them disagree with good faith face-to-face -face and to dampen some of the extreme kinds of things. And I see in the broader issue of where people have a kind of an open microphone or an open role, you know, the, what goes on, what's said on talk radio, for example, where it's very anonymous, you just blast it out there, what's said on email. You know, I wouldn't want to have those sorts of conversation to be the regular basis uh, for floor decisions. So I would rather have members have to face each other face-to-face, -face, listen to each other's comments, and then, and then vote as opposed to doing it remotely. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to begin to wrap this up uh, because we've really gone beyond the time that we had planned, and I'd, I'd like to call on Mr. Bielenson, the ranking minority member. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I agree very much with uh, what the professor from the Naval Academy just, just said. Let me say three or four things kind of briefly, if I may, Mr. Chairman. The first is that I found this very interesting, extremely interesting 
a meeting, and I, I, commend, I commend you for, for holding this hearing, and, and along with you, Mr. Chairman, I thank our witnesses, not only the three gentlemen here, but the two other gentlemen out there in the rest of the country for, for having uh, joined us. It's, uh, it's, it's been a, a learning process. One does, does not always learn at, at some of our committee hearings, as our, as our chairman uh, knows. Let me just comment briefly on three, on three things, if I may. Uh, doesn't, they don't require responses, but, but they're sort of my response, I guess, to what some people have been talking about. One is, one has to do with remote voting. Um, that's a very good example that you picked up from what Thomas Mann said, uh, worrying about, I mean, it is kind of worrisome thinking about voting there in your district office and, and there, there are 150 people chanting outside, some may be heavily armed, uh, you know, as to how you're going to vote on this issue that they feel very strongly about, uh, feel a little safer doing it here in Washington. But in, in, the, in the average case, one would suspect if you were voting, let's say, from your district office, what's more likely, I suppose, is that your little buzzer would, would ring or the phone rings or something, some indication that it's time to vote, and, and you'll say to your staff person there, what are we voting on now? You know, and you've got nobody to ask. You're sitting out there in, in Pueblo, Colorado, or Los Angeles, California, and all by yourself, and uh, it's time to vote. There's nobody to check in with. Um, uh, comes very back, much back to what our, our friend Mr. and colleague Mr. Ehlers was talking about, how useful it is to be here physically with other people, exactly for the reasons he suggested. And on top of that, even with respect to voting, I guess we shouldn't admit this, and you all don't need to, but I shall, since I don't, I'm not seeking re-election, uh, sometimes one doesn't quite know exactly what it is that one's voting on or all the pros and cons, although we have a lot of information before us, when one gets over to the floor. And you've got five or ten minutes in which to, and that's a lot of time actually, to check with two or three of your Democratic friends and two or three of your Republican friends uh, whose position on whatever issue or whatever general area of jurisdiction you're discussing at that time you've, you've come to, uh, to trust and, and find out from them exactly how they feel about it and it gives you a little more additional input if you need it or if you want it. Uh, before you vote. That's an important kind of thing and something we would not have if we were isolated out at some distance. Uh, I also want to say, although I enjoyed everybody's testimony, I particularly, I particularly enjoyed the testimony of, of, of Vern Ehlers, perhaps because we tend to start thinking the same ways if we're members of this, of this group or this uh, organization. One of the things that he spoke about, which I worry about and think about all the time, and we, which we've spoken about here today, Mr. Chairman, is I think Vern put it in, in terms of the revulsion of the public was the last thing I think he, he spoke uh, to. And we're, we're talking about how people react when they see us on, on, on television. It, it, it occurs to me that if you put any, any area of, of human relationships under the microscope, let's say, uh, you know, it, it won't look too pretty, it won't look too good. If you had C-SPAN watching your family relationships and family activities, you telling your kids to eat or, or get their work done or, or your spouse berating you for not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Or if C-SPAN were in there, whatever business you're in, you know, other than Congress, watching all of the machinations that are going on each day in your, in your office or whatever, uh, that won't look too pretty either. And by its very nature, as one of our, as one of our witnesses quite properly said just a few, few minutes ago, Congress, the legislative branch, acts by compromise. I mean, that's... that's People may not like it, uh, but it's true and it's good. We, we understand it's good. We move to the middle. We agree. We, we learn to, you know, make some compromises and some adjustments to one another. That's how a democracy th works. But it's probably not a very pretty thing to see. Um, so that by its very nature, I suppose, too much exposure to this perhaps, uh, uh, you know, necessitates a, some kind of a, a process that to the uninitiated or until they get used to it, as members have said, uh, witnesses have said, I guess as people get more sophisticated about it, they start understanding what it's like to be a legislator and, and what's necessary to make this, this system work. And finally, and a very basic thing to me at least, because I mean, I tend to be a bit computer illiterate and, and a few decades behind the times, I'm sure, but with respect to how it, the impact it would have on the Congress and the workings of the legislative branch, I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I suspect that I may be right about this, and, and then it's not always necessary or, or appropriate to, to be keeping up with the times or ahead of the times. I do not think that the problem is that we lack information. Uh, we have plenty of information, actually. There's a surfeit of information. And, the fr and to be frank about it, I sometimes joke about this back home, my job, our job is take out our little voting card and vote, either push the yes button or the no button. Now, you can have a lot of information going into your head, and which is very important in, in drafting testimony and drafting legislation and so on, but with the decisions, the actual decisions we make are relatively simple 
uh, dis decisions. We need what we need more of, I think, than information, which, as I said, there's plenty of these days. Right now, if you cut off the flow of information, I mean, didn't didn't extend it beyond what it is or expand it beyond what it is now. What we need is understanding and and wisdom, and uh, and judgment and experience, things of that sort. Uh, not just more stuff thrown at us, especially with the immediacy uh, that that some of us are, are speaking of. We don't we don't need more information more quickly. I think. I think if you, if you argue for that, I think you misunderstand, misunderstand what, what I at least believe is the nature or should be the nature of a legislative body, and of course, including the Congress. I mean, our job is to, is to filter things, to think about them, sit around, let them percolate, uh, not react immediately to everything in the world. I mean, that's part of our problem as a nation these days. You see stuff on, on CNN that goes on in some country that no one's ever heard of. And, and we're all sitting there watching at the same time, and we require our president, whoever he or she may be, five minutes later to react with a policy for the country. I mean, you know, you, we really should sit back and think, and should, should we be involved at all? Is this terribly important to us? And, you know, have some time to sit around and, and figure out what our reaction should be. It's the same with respect to, to legislation, writing legislation and, and responding to, to issues that, um, uh, that the public confronts us with, I mean, that, that we, that we filter this, that we take some time, that we not react immediately. Uh, that's, that's, that's the job of, of representative government. If we're, to, if we're to have a representative democracy rather than a, uh, a direct one, you, you need some people here who will take the time, who will go to hearings, who will listen to witnesses, who will deal with others uh, in the body whose points of view are somewhat different and eventually come out with something that, uh, you know, that fits well enough that uh, the country keeps moving ahead slowly in, in the very successful way, as our friend Mr. Goss quite properly pointed out, we've been doing for a couple of hundred uh, years. Uh, maybe that's just uh, an older person speaking, but I really think that the that this that the legislative that the legislative branch of the government was designed to be and should be a relatively slow-moving branch of the government to slow down and to and to and to put a break on the excesses of of, a, of the executive branch to look at things, as I've said a couple of times now, carefully, and not to respond or to react too quickly. And um, I guess I've had my say. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bielenson, and I think that was very well said. One of the things that when I went through the whole process of committee structure reform and, and co-chaired the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, I always hesitated when people talked about the fact that we need to make Congress more efficient. Inefficiency is something that the Founding Fathers were very careful to ensure would be part of the process of lawmaking. And as you said, it should be done slowly. But uh, when we talk about efficiency, we do want to get the information that we need efficiently, but we don't want to in any way jeopardize the deliberative nature of this institution, which is so important. Porter? Well, of course, I'm shocked, shocked to hear that uh, Mr. Bielenson uh, might want to ask somebody else on the floor. Mr. Bielenson is one of the most thoughtful, fully informed members, and I am sure. <laughs> the members. <laughs> but I, w I will say this uh, sincerely. I, I know that uh, it is very important. I, I don't think we're at the point where remote voting is, is the right idea yet. Maybe perhaps someday it will be. I very much uh, like to know what my colleagues in my state are thinking. I like to be able to watch the board about how committees are breaking down. I like to see whether we're crossing partisan lines. I like to see whether the issue uh, is playing one way or another in one region or another. And I, I think that that is all part of the mix and benefit. And I would hate to give that deliberative process up in the name of efficiency. And plus, I, I think the chairman has pointed out this idea of a, uh, an angry crowd outside the door. Uh, I can easily uh, uh, suggest a scenario where uh, somebody might miss a putt on the eighth hole because they suddenly had to interrupt their concentration and cast a vote, and that would be <laughs> terrible, too. So I, I'm, I'm just not quite ready to, to get to the remote voting. But uh, on the other area, the presumption of openness, uh, I think is very critical. I come from Florida, which is a sunshine state, and we do government in the sunshine. Of course, there have got to be exceptions. But one of the things, the challenges I would immediately throw out to Mr. Eisenach, and I agree with him that we should go for the presumption of openness, is that I guarantee you, if you know your schedule, your daily schedule is going to be subject to scrutiny, it will be printed one way. If it is just going to be a schedule that is going to guide you on where you go next and how you do it and what you're going to say to so-and-so and be personally private and never leave your pocket except for your own eyes, 
probably say something a little differently. There's nothing sinister there. It's just everybody is very concerned about political correctness. So instead of saying, five o'clock, go to the gym, have fun, play basketball for half an hour, it would probably say something like, five o'clock, important meeting uh, on health, uh, member's health, or something like that. There is a way to craft uh, things so you never do get to this openness, and that's the observation I was making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Porter. Uh, we are uh, running out of time here, and I want to express my appreciation to uh, Secretary Flavin, who's still with us, of course, my colleague Scott McGinnis, to our three witnesses who are here, and also our appreciation to uh, House Information Resources and to uh, C-SPAN and all of the people who have made this uh, experiment in looking at the 21st. Uh, uh, Secretary Flavin, are you speaking up there? Somebody's. Were you